Good evening everyone, time for another Bitcoin report. Now this is the one hour chart of the Bitcoin provided by ClarkMoody.com. Now you can see here on this chart each one of these candlesticks is a one hour time period. So the big one here is going to be the spike top that went to 900. You can see the bottom of it is about 580 something, we'll just call it 600. So a 300 point move on that one hour uh, volume spike. Now that spike is about 20,000 bitcoins and the importance of that volume we're going to see when we talk about money laundering in a bit but I wanted to talk about the technicals of support and resistance and how those work. So the way that markets trade, and I will say that I do believe that the, the Bitcoin is still a free market. I don't know of any way that it can be manipulated. Of course, we know that the government supposedly has a large number of Bitcoins that were seized during the Silk Road bust. I don't know whether or not they actually have access to those coins or not. But in theory, they have a large number of coins that they can dump. But then again, they can only dump those one time. Uh, were they dumped here? I don't know. But be that as it may, the basis of support and resistance, the whole idea behind that is really very simple. And that is that markets, bull markets especially, tend to run in these parabolic moves. That is people piling on top of each other to buy something that's rising to make a profit and uh, they're hoping to sell it at a higher price. Now what happens is when you get these type of parabolic blow-offs then you have a number of people who have bought in at a high price. Now if those people didn't buy and sell quickly but held on then with a massive drop like this then those people are suddenly at a loss. Those people that are sitting at a loss they're the ones that cause overhead resistance because it's human nature that once you realize that you've made a mistake instead of cutting your losses short which is just taking your losses whatever they are most people will wait for the market to come back up to the price that they bought to get out even to not take a loss and uh, that's what causes the selling pressure above the market now we can see that we had a rally into the the uh, resistance levels here when we got up to about 620. That was a point that I marked off on the blog with a trend line chart showing that 620 was a very, very key level. And we did get a significant sell-off around 630 down to about 550. There were a large number of people that bought in this area that were showing a loss. and. Uh, I will assume that a number of them sold to get out at even and that's what caused this downdraft. Then we saw a slow emergence of buyers come in and we managed to get above that entire price range here and now we're rallying at about 760. The high we hit today is around 782 or so. So as far as resistance what that leaves up above us is this this spike here and the major spike here we can't say how much selling volume was at the bottom here we could get more granular but I'm not going to take the time to do that analysis so we know that that large number of bitcoins was sold at these high prices there's some overhead resistance but there isn't a lot most of this selling volume including these two spikes right here we're way past that and everybody that bought on those downdrafts is showing a significant gain. So there aren't too many people left who are at a loss and that's the way bull markets work. When you're talking about a bull market, as soon as you break out into new highs, then what that means is that every single person in the entire world who owns whatever the security or item is, Bitcoin, stocks, commodities, it doesn't matter. Every person who owns it is showing a gain. That is a very, very bullish situation. That's why you have these explosive moves to the upside when you break out above the last high. Because at that point that you break out 
above the last historical high, every person who still owns this is showing a gain. And uh, there's no overhead resistance. There's no one sitting in a loss who's waiting up above the market to sell into it as it gets back to the price that they bought at. So that's where we are now. It's very bullish, but there still is that amount of resistance in the initial sell-off. Now, when I first saw the size of this candlestick spike and the reversal, it was my opinion that we had reached an interim top. That doesn't mean that that is the top. It just means that it's an interim top. There was an interim top that occurred at about $30 and uh, that actually took two years to recover and break out into new highs and then we ran to that 270 price or so then that took about six months seven months to be broken out of and that's the latest run that we have so the big question is going to be are we at another one of these tops I initially thought that was the case but now that's starting to come into doubt when we look at the strength of this rise here it's not looking like a spike top like the last one that we had but it's rallying into that you can see if you look at the last top that we had at that 266 price as soon as we got that down spike the the market went down a negative candlestick it had another negative candlestick all the way down I believe it was a fifty dollar price and then we had a long-term consolidation and final rally so I'm torn at this point whether or not we've put a top in an intermediate term top or whether we're not actually going to rally and go much higher from here the target I initially mentioned was three thousand that's going to be the tenfold rule from the last top so it's going to be determined in the next few days whether or not that is the case now if we look at the market depth here it's similar to what we've seen in the past we're talking about 25,000 for total bitcoins offered on Mt. Gox the 10,000 number is sitting at about 900 price if we go over to the bids we can see that uh, 550 we've got 11,000 there so a very very deep market as far as the number of dollars bidding for bitcoins you can see down at the seventy five dollar price we actually reach a hundred thousand bid that's gonna be four times the amount offered so the picture of the demand for bitcoins is still very very bullish and uh, there doesn't seem to be a large number of people willing to part with their bitcoins even at these prices now let's go over and look at this issue of money laundering and uh, keep these volume figures in mind uh, one of the accusations against the Bitcoin has been of course all of the accusations are related to crime and all kinds of nefarious activities but uh, money laundering is one of the accusations that has been leveled against the Bitcoin and I'm gonna try to show you that uh, that is a completely specious argument there's no basis for it whatsoever uh, we know from the testimony and we know from other UN documents etc that money laundering is a huge business the global drug trade uh, what are the other crimes mafia uh, slavery we don't know what all the crimes are that are involved in money laundering but money laundering basically is an attempt to clean dirty money so let's read some of this money laundering is the process of concealing sources of money money evidently gained through crime is dirty money and money that has been oh, sorry about that money money that has been laundered to appear as if it came from a legitimate source is clean money money can be laundered by many methods which vary in complexity and sophistication different countries may or may not treat tax evasion or payments in breach of international sanctions as money laundering some jurisdictions differentiate these for definition purposes and others do not 
Some jurisdictions define money laundering as obfuscating sources of money, either intentionally or by merely using financial systems or services that do not identify or track sources or destinations. Other jurisdictions define money laundering to include money from activity that would have been a crime in that jurisdiction, even if it was legal where the actual conduct occurred. This broad brush of applying money laundering to incidental, extraterritorial, or simply privacy-seeking behaviors has led some to label financial thought crime. Many regulatory and governmental authorities issue estimates each year for the amount of money laundered, either worldwide or within their national economy in 1996. That's kind of interesting that uh, the best they can get is 1996. The International Monetary Fund estimated that 2 to 5% of the worldwide global economy involved laundered money. The Financial Action Task Force on Money Laundering, FATF, an intergovernmental body set up to combat money laundering, stated overall, it is absolutely impossible to produce a reliable estimate of the amount of money laundered, and therefore the FATF does not publish any figures in this regard. Academic commentators have likewise been unable to estimate the volume of money with any degree of assurance. Now, if you remember during the congressional testimony, they cited that figure of $1.6 trillion, and uh, I think that's actually low. But let's look real quick here at the methods of money laundering. Money laundering is commonly defined as occurring in three steps. The first step involves introducing cash into the financial system by some means placement. The second involves carrying out complex financial transactions to camouflage the illegal source layering. And the final step entails acquiring wealth generated from the transaction of the illicit funds integration. Some of these steps may be omitted depending on the circumstances. For example, non-cash proceeds that are already in the financial system would have no need for placement. Money laundering takes several different forms, although most methods can be categorized in one of a few types. These include bank methods, smurfing, also known as structuring, currency exchanges, and double invoicing. Now, it goes into all of the methods of money laundering, and what I want you to notice here is that every single one of these methods has to do with a bank. In other words, it has to do with cash, and it has to do with getting cash into and out of a bank. And that's where we get the anti-money laundering laws, the AML. Anti-money laundering is a term mainly used in the financial and legal industries to describe the legal controls that require financial institutions and other regulated entities to prevent, detect, and report money laundering activities. Anti-money laundering guidelines come in, came into prominence globally as a result of the formation of the Financial Action Task Force, FATF, and promulgation of an international framework of anti-money laundering standards. These standards began to have more relevance in 2000 and 2001 after FATF began a process to publicly identify countries that were deficient in their anti-money laundering laws and international cooperation, a process colloquially known as name and shame. An effective AML program requires a jurisdiction to have criminalized money laundering, given the relevant regulators and police the powers and tools to investigate, be able to share information with our countries, etc. So it goes deeper into that. Now I wanted to take you over to an article about money laundering and the Bitcoin. And uh, this goes more into depth about the Bitcoin and money laundering. This is called, Are Bitcoins the Criminal's Best Friend? Until very recently, the virtual currency known as Bitcoins could be mistaken for just another internet fad. The Winklevoss twins of Facebook fame even had a role. But when federal law enforcement closed the Silk Road, the widely popular online illegal drug emporium that used Bitcoin as a medium of exchange, politicians and policymakers took notice Criminals, it turns out, really like bitcoins, which can be exchanged for nefarious purposes on the dark web with complete anonymity and, it seems, impunity. The shift to a virtual currency signals a huge and worrisome shift in behavior for criminals who for decades have favored cold hard cash with the dollar, the preferred medium of exchange. 
just how alarmed we should be is one of the topics of a hearing today, etc. Now it goes into Bitcoin, it goes into the Liberty Reserve and uh, the Bank Secrecy Act. In 1970, Congress passed the Bank Secrecy Act, which attempted to make it impossible to launder money through the U.S. banking system. Under its terms, banks had to report cash transactions in excess of $10,000 via a currency transaction report. Some banks complied with the regulations, others didn't. In the late 1970s and early 80s, federal law enforcement officials, the Internal Revenue Service, and Customs Service all created task forces to target money laundering of this sort. The first of these, Operation Greenback, led to the prosecution of both money launderers and banks for violations of the BSA. Other high-profile campaigns followed. Now, it goes on into the history of money laundering, and I wanted to show you a list here that they give. Actually, that's back on the Wikipedia article. And that is a list of some of the prosecutions that happened. These are the notable cases regarding money laundering. The first one is BCCI. You probably remember that. That was the Bank of uh, Crim Crooks and Criminals International. Unknown amount estimated in billions of criminal proceeds, including drug trafficking money laundered during the mid-1980s. And if you go and investigate that, you'll find a lot of politicians were uh, owners and involved with the BCCI. Bank of New York, U.S. $7 billion of Russian capital flight laundered through accounts controlled by bank executives in the late 1990s. Ferdinand Marcos, we all know about him. In December 2012, HSBC paid a record $1.9 billion in fines for money laundering hundreds of millions of dollars for drug traffickers, terrorists, and sanctioned governments such as Iran. The money laundering occurred through the 2000s. Now, the question I would ask is that if HSBC laundered hundreds of millions of dollars, and I think that it was much larger than that, but there was a $1.9 billion fine for that, then how did they get around the structuring? Uh, well, I guess, uh, like the saying goes, um, if you want to steal, then you should own a bank. So the big problem is not going to be the $10,000 limit, but the bankers. Uh, the next one here is Liberty Reserve. If you go and look at that, actually the latest release on that is that the owner pled guilty, but we still haven't got the actual facts in that case. Institute for Works of Religion, Italian authorities investigate suspected money laundering transactions amounting to $218 million made by IOR, several Italian banks. Noru, U.S. $70 billion of Russian capital flight laundered through unregulated Noru offshore, offshore banks. Senabacha, $2 to $5 billion of government assets laundered through banks in the U.K., Luxembourg, Jersey, Switzerland, and by the president of Nigeria. And Standard Chartered paid a $330 million in fines for money laundering. Hundreds of billions of dollars for Iran. The money laundering took place in the 2000s and occurred for nearly a decade to hide 60,000 transactions worth $250 billion. So, the question is, if we're talking about money laundering and the Bitcoin, when we look at the number here of Bitcoins that were traded, we'll go back to the hourly chart, we can see that the peak here was about 20,000 Bitcoins in this spike of about $400. 20,000 Bitcoins, we're talking roughly $10 million or so. So that is a drop in the bucket, and of course that is the largest spike here. So how is it possible that the Bitcoin could have anything to do with money laundering? We know that that's not the case right now. Maybe they're concerned about the future, but uh, clearly with these tiny, tiny volumes moving the price of Bitcoin, it can't be anything to do with money laundering because those numbers are just too large.
Now, if you think about the type of crime that we're talking about, primarily we're going to be talking about drug dealing. If we're talking about drug dealing on the street, or we're talking about things like maybe prostitution or organized crime, you're talking about cash ex exchanging hands on the street, and large sums of that cash need to be laundered. How is that cash going to interface with the Bitcoin? We know that the Bitcoin, to buy Bitcoins, you have to deposit money in a bank, then transfer that money, and uh, we have new rules coming up about wire transfers right now, but you have to transfer that money over to, to Mt. Gox or one of the other exchanges, which already are compliant with the anti-money laundering structuring rules, and then you'd have to buy your bitcoins, then you would have to sell your bitcoins, you'd have to take the money back out through a bank, and uh, that would be supposedly how you launder the money. So obviously until crime is being perpetrated using bitcoins, now the Silk Road apparently was uh, something of that happening, but the bulk of drug dealing and all of the crimes that go on in the world obviously go on through cash and that cash has to be deposited in a bank and then that cash has to be transferred to an exchange where bitcoins can be purchased it really doesn't make a lot of sense that uh, the bitcoin would be used for any of this money laundering and we know that the largest drug trades in history have not been operated by uh, computer people or operated by private citizens but have actually been operated by governments. We know that uh, England was involved in the opium trade. There's very, very suspicious activity going on with the United States government in Afghanistan, etc. So we know there's a very, very large trade of money laundering going on right now it has happened up to this time and it has absolutely nothing to do with the Bitcoin. So if we're talking about money laundering and the Bitcoin, uh, it's my opinion that that's just a ruse. That's just an attempt to smear the Bitcoin. And uh, there's really no basis for attaching the Bitcoin to money laundering. There's just no basis whatsoever. And we'll talk to you next time.